Last week, uh, many of us offered wisdom about wisdom. <laughs> Um, and one of the wisest insights came from Martha Mannheim, who saw the service on the website uh, on her 97th birthday. Uh, Martha wrote back, she wrote a comment, the, the hard part about wisdom is that wisdom comes mostly through difficulty in living. If it weren't painful, we would not learn. And it's true, sometimes we need to hit rock bottom. Uh, Jacob is a great example of this. Jacob uh, tricked his brother Esau uh, into trading his entire inheritance for a bowl of stew. And then Jacob tricked his father, Isaac, Isaac into giving him the blessing that should have gone to Esau. So Esau vowed to kill Jacob. So Jacob ran away, and then he grew rich by tricking his father-in-law after his father-in-law had tricked him. <laughs> now, this is the holiest family in the Bible, <laughs> mind you. Uh, th th this is the descendants of Abraham and the forebears of Moses and Jesus. If you were God, what would you do with these lying, cheating tricksters, <laughs> you know? Well, what God did was throw Jacob to rock bottom so he would grow up. God sent Jacob back to Esau, who came to meet him with an army of 400 men. On the eve of what looked like certain death, a man came and wrestled with Jacob. It was the same presence of God that comes to us when we wrestle with our troubles all night. The man wounded him in the hip, and yet Jacob still held on. So the men blessed Jacob and gave him a new name, Israel, which combines Hebrew words for God and struggle. God and struggle. Jacob rose from the dust, limping from his wound, exhausted and empty, and blessed, blessed with the power to make peace with Esau. God and struggle is the formula for wisdom, for transformation, for maturing and evolving. God and struggle. I suspect that you know this. I suspect that you have had times of struggle when you wrestled with God, when you held on and emerged, wounded but blessed. I know that I have. Right now, all humanity, all God's earth is caught up in struggle. By entering into it with faith, we will receive both the wound of grief and the blessing of wisdom and power that God knows we need. So let us worship together.
now, once again, we are the children. We are all the children uh, here. Um, so, uh, so good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Um, so, stories that we have heard before uh, take on a new meaning as we grow and change, and the world changes around us. This is why we tell the same stories. We come to church and we hear the same stories over and over again, and yet we get new things out of them. So I'm going to tell you a story that you have probably heard before, um, and I invite you to listen carefully to, uh, to see what it says to you now. So here it is. Uh, once upon a time, a school science class was watching a butterfly hatch from its cocoon. And the butterfly was struggling. Uh, it could not get its wings free, its big wings free. And it kept struggling and then collapsing and struggling more. And finally, a, a girl in the class couldn't stand it anymore. And she, she felt so sorry for the beautiful thing that she reached out to help. And the science teacher told her, no, no, you can't do that. Butterflies need the struggle against the cocoon in order to strengthen their wings. They can't fly unless they struggle first. So there are things that we want in life, but we have to go through struggles to get them. And those struggles are important parts of the journey. We actually need them to prepare us. But here is an interesting thing. All the spiritual traditions exist to help us when we are struggling. We need to struggle, but all the religious traditions, um, you know, that they have the golden rule and they've got love your neighbor as yourself, the compassion. Um, and so the truth of the matter is that we need both. We need challenges that force us to strengthen our wings. And we also need to be held by loving support, like the science teacher who protected the butterfly and helped the girl learn. I remember when I, when I learned to ride a bike, uh, my mother had to let me wobble and fall and skin my legs and get back up and try again, which must have been really hard for her. <laughs> but she also stood near enough to keep me from careening into the street and getting run over. Um, so it never ends, uh, ideally, uh, growing up and, and learning to do new things. And right now, our whole world is growing up, we hope, uh, learning that we have to treat the Earth and one another better. Humanity has to break out of its old cocoon we need to keep struggling. We need to keep struggling to do it. And at the same time, we need love and compassion and comfort because it is so hard to make such a big change. So there's something that we can do uh, that helps us find the inspiration and courage and strength that we need in order to keep struggling. And there is also something we can do that helps us feel held and loved and comforted as we struggle. And the interesting thing is that it's the same something that does both. And I bet you can't guess what it is. <laughs> pray, exactly. Jesus put it this way. Pray always and do not faint. Do not give up. Pray always. So, so we're going to pray the, uh, the traditional uh, version of the, uh, the Lord's Prayer. And, if, uh, and Justin will screen share it. And if you, if you need it, it's on, the, uh, it's on the pew card, the top one, the traditional version. So uh, let, us, uh, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
for today. Turn it, okay, I'll take it down. Whew, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, the humor here. Okay, uh, the first reading is Psalm 121 from the King James Version. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved, that he keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, that he keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper, the Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy going in, coming in from this time forth and ever and even forevermore. Let's do the last line again. <laughs> it's, the Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. The second reading is from Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Here ends the reading. Last week, we read from the book of Proverbs where wisdom calls out, lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. Human history is full of people laying aside their immaturity and living and walking in a whole new way based on insight and wisdom. Think of the young Buddha seeing suffering and death and struggling with it until he became still and blossomed into enlightenment. Th think of 30-year-old Jesus, 30-year-old Jesus struggling in the wilderness with the temptations of his ego and overcoming them to emerge full of the Holy Spirit's wisdom and power. Think of decadent young Francis, uh, immersed in the materialism and violence of a society that promised to make him rich when he gave up everything and walked naked and penniless out of Assisi. 
Think of timid Gandhi rising against racist oppression and fulfilling the Sermon on the Mount like no one since Jesus. Think of Nelson Mandela struggling for 27 years in apartheid prison and emerging with so much wisdom and spiritual power that he could transform his nation. Think of Greta Thunberg and Malala Yousafzai and so many other amazing young women today whose will to struggle has made them wise beyond their years to help humanity mature. The will to struggle is a gift from the spirit of life, like the will of the butterfly to break free from its cocoon. But there are different ways that humans can struggle, and it makes a huge difference which way we choose. One of the greatest tragedies of our time was that we did not follow spiritual wisdom in 2001 after the terrorist attacks on the United States. We had a moment when our suffering and grief could have led us to greater compassion for other wounded countries, when we could have seen how our own materialism and violence led to the resentment and the desperation that motivated the terrorists. As Bill Coffin pointed out, we had the goodwill of the entire world and we squandered it. We could have brought humanity together as one to create a global society of such justice and love of neighbor that we disarmed the terrorists without revenge. But instead, we invaded Afghanistan. And 20 years later, we are seeing the disastrous results for our nation and for the world and for those poor, poor people. We had the will to struggle, but not the right struggle. Our national ego, our smallest, meanest, collective, selfish self, chose the way that we would struggle. The easy way that avoided facing our immaturity, that required no inner growth, and condemned us, therefore, to repeat the suffering of the ages. We see examples of right struggle in today's scriptures. Pilgrims on a hard journey lift up their eyes to the hills when their instinct would be to look down to their feet. Right struggle is to place our trust in the guidance of a higher power rather than in our basest self-interest. Right struggle is to keep striving for God's realm, following the paths of righteousness in the faith that everything else will work out for the good if we do that even when the sun smites us by day and there is no shade in sight. Right struggle is to knock at God's door like the widow and keep knocking even when we get no answer, even when it seems that God does not hear or care, when we doubt that there is a moral arc to the universe that bends toward justice. Right struggle is to wrestle with God all night and not give up, to believe that the spirit of this world that breaks our heart or puts our hip out of joint will also bless us, and that both the pain and the blessing will help us grow and fulfill our calling to establish the beloved community of God's realm on earth, making peace even with the Esau who wants to kill us, making peace even with our past wrongs. The scriptures and the, and the Christian contemplative or mystical tradition lay out a path of wisdom through struggle. And that path is described in the ancient Greek terms that I've used before uh, as leading from kenosis to metanoia to agape, 
to koinonia, which means from self-emptying to spiritual transformation to unconditional love to beloved community, to the realm of God on earth. Today, we see many forms of struggle in response to a world in upheaval. Some are self-serving, like amassing great wealth, or grabbing power, or building walls. Survivalists are prepping. Proud boys are taking target practice. Many around us are living in denial or despair as the news gets worse. Many are paralyzed by fear, and we need to have compassion on all of these. But in our church family, we have people who are like the pilgrim in the psalm, and the widow at the door, and Jacob wrestling with God. We have people who have the will to struggle, and they are choosing the right struggle, to turn to the Spirit, to trust in God's higher power, to follow the way of Christ, even, even when it seems it could not possibly help. You know, it's easy to look back at the Buddha, at Jesus, at Francis, at Gandhi, at Thunberg or Malala, and, and to imagine that they knew the difference that they could make if they undertook the right struggle. But you know, that's not the way it was. The Buddha was determined not to get up from under that Bodhi tree until he had found a new way forward. But he had no way, no way of knowing that he would. And he had to struggle a long time to get there. Jesus sweated blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus felt forsaken on the cross. It was all gone. It was all to no good. Francis was literally naked, laughed at. He was as weak and vulnerable and helpless as he could be when he placed his trust entirely in God. No idea how things would work out. Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Mother Teresa struggled terribly with a spiritual crisis in which she rarely felt any hint of God's existence. It lasted for over 45 years. And yet she had the faith to endure, to keep struggling and enduring. She recited the prayer of St. Francis every day. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. That dark night of soul did not stop even when she won the Nobel Peace Prize. And was eventually, of course, she was eventually canonized for the order that she founded that vows to give wholehearted free service to the poorest of the poor. We have no way of knowing that our struggle will make a difference, that we will be able to change human civilization enough and fast enough to save life on earth. But the wisdom born of past struggles tells us that anxiety about success leads us down the wrong path. We need to keep wrestling, keep knocking, keep walking on in faith, trusting that this inner process will allow God's higher power to flow through us as we go. So let us pray in silence, however discouraged or tired of the struggle we may feel, consenting once again to God's loving presence and transforming action within us, giving it all to God, and asking the Holy Spirit to give us in return the will and the wisdom that we need. Let us pray.
Amen. Welcome to United Church of Stratford, Vermont on this 13th Sunday after Pentecost. Um, and welcome to you who are in the sanctuary and welcome also to, uh, to those of you who are with us on Zoom. Uh, please let us know if you have any trouble uh, hearing, uh, hearing us on, the, uh, uh, on Zoom. Uh, please see the uh, announcements in the bulletin. Um, if you are on Zoom, you can... You can find the, uh, uh, the bulletin on our website. If you go to the, uh, to the welcome page, um, you'll see the menu across the top and you can find bulletins there. Um, we invite people in the uh, pews to linger after the service for the pleasure of neighborliness and ice cream and, uh, on the front lawn. Um, uh, if, if the weather hasn't turned and uh, Hurricane Henry blown in by then. <laughs> um, Please note that the Arthur Robinson uh, Memorial event is next Sunday afternoon. 
Uh, we are invited to honor Arthur and show our support for the family by lining the road uh, from their farm near Taylor Valley uh, all the way to the, um, to the townhouse. And uh, the family will walk behind a tractor uh, that will be pulling a farm cart um, that will have his casket in it. So the family will be walking behind. Um, and once they reach the cemetery, they're going to proceed alone, uh, just the family, um, up to a private graveside ceremony uh, because of uh, some of the family members have, uh, are at high risk for COVID. So they're keeping that, that small. Any questions about that event? When, when do we recognize? Yeah, good question. Thank you. Um, one o'clock. Uh, they're going to leave the farm at one o'clock. Um, so uh, I don't know how long it takes to get down here. They, you know, uh, I think I said maybe in the weekly email that they, um, you know, they, they used to drive their cattle down to the village to graze here. So it's it's a family, you know, tradition going back generations to make that walk. So it's. Just a really beautiful, um, I think it's a really beautiful tribute. So, Any other announcements that need to be made, um, either uh, by people in the sanctuary or, or on Zoom? Any announcements? Okay, I don't, don't see anybody raising their hand. So, um, uh, so we are going to, um, be doing our, uh, we are the choir today, uh, all of us um, on Zoom and, um, and in the sanctuary. Uh, we, we're augmenting the choir anyway. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so in your blue folder, in your hymn folder, uh, you will find um, an in words to the introit, and Anamika will teach it, and the choir will teach it to you. So. We will start with a rise up of flame as introit, and um, basically we'll sing it three times through, and you can start humming along to learn the melody, and then we'll divide you up in two groups, and that's going to be really fun. So I will lead one group, I will lead this side, and you both are going to lead that side. Um, so we're just going to sing a lot today. Um, it's just it's just a sunny day, and lots of our choir members have been loyal here every week and that's just family traveling and stuff and um, but so we thought well maybe it would be fun to teach you some rounds that are very beautiful and not too hard to learn so there we go we will sing it three times and as we sing this just try to catch the melody in the words and then we'll split you up Oh, <laughs> 